G'day folks. Well over the years we have filmed hundreds of incredibly talented people across the world. Many of these artists have gone on to produce their own videos as well. We hope you enjoy this great lesson from one of our Colour in Your Life artists. This full sheet water media painting is based on a smaller 12 by 16 inch study you see here. And it's an interesting subject because the light trees against the dark background requires either to mask off the trees and then paint them in later or use gouache to paint over the previous layers. In this demonstration I'm using the gouache. This is my John Pike palette and brushes at the ready and my first watercolor color string. I start by saturating the top half of a 20 by 30 arch 300 pound sheet of paper with clear water and then I begin applying Holbein Indian Yellow and Lizarin Crimson and some burnt sienna in very saturated strokes with my 2 inch flat in my uh, Richeson size 20 round. I work very intensely with color because the sheet's wet and I know those colors are going to fade. We're essentially water managers when we paint with water color and uh, the water either exists in the brush, in the paint, on the paper, or sometimes all three. In the case where we work wet into wet and we've soaked our paper, we have to be mindful that we do not need much water in our paint or in our brush because it's already there on the paper. And you will see that I work very quickly, even in this speeded up format. I do not let my brush tarry very long in any location because if I do, that wet paper surface will suck all the paint right out of the brush. Now I'm beginning to work on the uh, foreground and I wanted a soft edge there and so that's why I wet uh, that sheet and let it touch the violet that was up in the forest. That's followed by a sedimentary Naples yellow and then a cerulean blue over the top of that to create a soft green followed by cobalt blue almost directly out of the tube just enough water to make that paint liquid. It's really fun at this point to splatter paint. Those splatters will soften up as the paper dries and you can create some lovely textures that way. Plus it's just fun. Here I'm intensing, intensifying that edge adding some red violets and some burnt siennas with some alizarin in them and then tilting the paper back up to kind of control the spread of that wash. The upper part of the sheet has dried quite a bit though and so the marks I make up there will stand out and they'll be distinctive. They won't spread as much and so I'm paying attention to all those things as I paint. Once you start wetting a sheet, the uh, what we call the watercolor clock has started ticking and that refers to the amount of time it takes for a sheet to uh, dry out. The evaporation process varies depending on whether your air conditioning is on or your furnace is on and so we have to be mindful of what's happening at every moment during the painting. One of the tools we have in our toolbox is of course removing paint as well as putting paint down. And as long as the sheet is still damp, we can remove paint as long as we're careful not to abrade the surface with our brush. So I use plenty of water and carefully mop up the uh, loose paint. Here I'm putting almost pure cadmium yellow right out of the tube into that damp shape for that cedar tree. I'm going to paint this cedar tree half wet and half wet on dry. So the upper half is a uh, continuing the wet into wet style. As the bottom is drying I'll be able to apply the paint to the bottom uh, wet on dry. And here you see me adjusting my tones, colors, values as that wet sheet begins to evaporate on me. And now I'm beginning to uh, connect up that wet with um, the bottom Prussian blue and green which is going wet on dry. I like this Richeson size 20 brush because it has a very fine point which allows me to do these feathery 
thin strokes and yet it has a very fat belly which will carry a lot of paint and allow me to uh, push a little more pressure on it and create much fatter strokes. Again I'm using paint that has just enough water in it to keep it liquid. And there you see the progress. So I'm deepening some of the tones. Again with watercolor, I haven't started using any gouache yet. I'd like to get as much of the painting done as watercolor as possible. Deepening some tones on the bottom with some ultramarine mixed into that cobalt. And now starting on another cedar tree. This one's fully in shade. The scene is really at the end of the day. Um, where there's a hill behind me and so part of the trees are brightly lit and part of them are in deep shade. Here's a little baby cedar going in on a damp area so it softens back into it. These cedars can turn very orange in the winter if they get dried out. Here you can see me using sedimentary paint to shove that green out of that cedar tree and that's a nice technique if you haven't tried it. Um, as long as the color is soaking wet you can always take a sedimentary paint and applying it practically right out of the tube it will create a space for itself inside a staining color. This is my first gouache mix with my size 10 uh, pointed sable at the bottom. Gouache works very well with watercolor but uh, it can be a little frustrating because the uh, the way it dries is somewhat unpredictable sometimes the light colors dry dark and sometimes the dark colors dry light and only by using them and gaining some experience can you really know which will do what. Here you see me painting wet into wet on the gouache. I do that because I like my strokes to sort of melt into each other as much as they can. Gouache has a tendency to thicken and create impasto effects if you don't paint wet into wet. And I like to keep my gouache very thin and more like a watercolor and less like a tempera paint. These sycamores come in a wide variety of colors. This is basically a sycamore and cedar forest. And here you can see me painting in the white sycamores that are in full sunlight and creating some gray-blue shadow areas on them while they're still wet. Still using that size 10 pointed sable. As I paint, you may be able to notice how some of these gouaches are shifting their value and, and even their colors a little bit as they dry. So um, I have to go back and forth and reestablish certain colors as they dry. As I'm working on this painting, I'm kind of thinking about my next steps always. I'm planning ahead, thinking about the colors um, and how to pull this vision off. Um, I have to restrain myself from doing details up front. I need to get the basic shapes, tones, and washes in in the largest masses I can do at first, and then gradually add some details as I'm beginning to do here. This is all gouache work, opaque right over the top of the previous watercolor to create all those intersecting branches. This is the rigor brush I use to create the finest branches. And this is a very nice brush because it has not only a very fine point, but it has some belly to it so it'll carry a lot of paint. And the technique is to start at the tree trunk, typically with the fattest strokes,
and then as I draw the branch out toward the tip, I raise that brush up onto its own tip and create the finest lines that way because these branches tend to taper from thick to thin and we want to mimic that to suggest nature. One of the tricks in a very complicated painting like this is to only put in as much detail as is necessary to convey the suggestion of the subject. We want the viewers to participate in our painting and if we provide too much detail we won't let them in. They won't be able to participate. We want them to to help complete the painting for us as it were. Here I'm going back into the cedar and richening up the colors. Some of them faded as uh, that previous layer dried. But I'm using pretty much straight watercolor tube paint here rather than gouache. I try to reserve the gouache for only those places that need uh, full opacity. The forest is looking pretty good now. It's got a nice dimension to it, nice light and shade. So I'm going to move forward in space uh, at this point. And I'm thinking about this scene, uh, which I visited many times, and what it might need to finish the painting. And I remember on several occasions there have been deer down in this area. And I'm beginning to think I want to add some deer to the picture. using that size 20 brush now. I use the biggest brush I can possibly get away with. I only switch to smaller brushes if I have no other choice. Now I'm building that large cedar tree on the right with um, some more watercolor laid in first. That's the Indian yellow, the Holbein Indian yellow. And I take the watercolor as far as it'll go before I switch over to gouache. I could have left a big hole for this tree and sort of painted around it, but I decided to use the uh, opaque parts of the gouache to help me draw it back over the top of the previous watercolor trees. Here you can see me softening the gouache back into the background with a two inch brush. I like to make the gouache melt a little bit back into the watercolor so I don't have this uh, slick gouache surface on top. I want both surfaces to marry together and look very similar. So I'm constantly softening those uh, gouache surfaces a little bit. I'm using watercolor here, some Prussian blue, straight Prussian blue to create those darks. A little bit of Windsor Violet there. Now you can see how the gouache looks as it dries when I'm building that tree. It's almost done. And the tree looks pretty good. Now I'm beginning to finish the little details uh, at the border between the forest and the ground plane, the floor there, and add some more twigs and stems down in there. Most little fiddly details I save for the end because you may find you actually don't need them. Some little touches here to suggest grass hummocks. And now I'm strengthening that foreground cedar. Again, I get out my rigger brush because I'm beginning to paint the canes in for the wild roses and the blackberries. And you may notice how this gouache dries a little differently. It it's quite light when it dries out, but that's just these colors. Another color might dry differently. So I had to test this before I got onto my final sheet, and that's part of what the study is for. Now I'm looking at my photo reference for deer. These are pictures I've taken. I printed one out and watercolored it to match the color scheme of the painting, and then I put some Conti crayon on the back of my drawing so I could transfer it. This is kind of like tracing paper or carbon paper this way. Then I start by removing as much of the watercolor paint as I think I need to from the background. 
which leaves this nice violet tone which I want in the final anyway so my deer sort of uh, pre-colored and pre-harmonized to my painting by having that violet in them I start with watercolor uh, on these deer and then end in gouache and here I'm putting the final gouache touches on and the deer are finished and this is the finish of November light water media painting